You are listening to Looking Beyond Lawyers to Bridge the Civil Access to Justice Gap, Petition for Redress of Grievances Pursuant to North Carolina Constitution Article 1, Section 12, Policy Analysis, and Legislative Proposal. Date, February 2023. Authored by Alicia Mitchell Mercer. This report was commissioned by the North Carolina Justice for All Project and is available at www.ncjfap.org. For permission to reprint, please contact JFAP. Copyright, copyright 2022 JFAP, the North Carolina Justice for All Project, All Rights Reserved. Appendices. Attached to the written report are letters of support from renowned champions of access to justice and policy experts, both individuals and institutions, affirming the validity of the content and proposals presented in our report. Please review the full report on our website, www.ncjfap.org, to view these letters, link below. You can find a list of our access to justice supporters in the description below. We thank these generous contributors for their time and expertise that helped shape this legislative proposal. Footnotes. Footnotes are excluded from this audio version of the report. To see footnote references, please view the full copy of the report. Executive Summary. The right to representation by counsel in a criminal proceeding is a fundamental right guaranteed by the U.S. Constitution. However, no such right exists in civil matters where outcomes for self-represented litigants, SRLs, can be similarly devastating. In many cases, meeting one's most basic needs is predicated upon fair and effective access to our civil justice system. Without access to justice, individuals cannot protest wrongdoing or hold decision makers accountable for their actions. Meaningful access to our civil justice system typically requires hiring a lawyer. Without legal counsel, it is nearly impossible to understand the complexities of North Carolina statutes, case law, procedural rules, and which of the 1,900 local rules and forms apply to an individual case. The loss of a person's home, children, employment, income, and freedom frequently results from their lack of understanding. There is a saying in the legal profession that a man who represents himself has a fool for a client. Unfortunately, when most people discover they need a lawyer, they also realize they cannot afford one. At that time, many also learn they are ineligible for legal aid or pro bono services. These individuals fall into the access to justice gap. The access to justice gap is the difference between the civil legal needs of low-income and increasingly middle-income Americans and the resources available to meet those needs. Between 4.1 and 5.2 million of North Carolina's almost 10.4 million residents fall into the access to justice gap for these individuals. Their only options are to stumble through the civil justice system alone or have their most basic needs go unmet. Contributing to this crisis is North Carolina General Statute Section 84, Unauthorized Practice of Law, also referred to as UPL Statutes. In most states, including North Carolina, only attorneys can practice law. Thus, these laws create a monopoly for lawyers. When someone not licensed to practice law provides services that only attorneys can perform, according to North Carolina General Statute Section 84-8, they have committed a crime. While lawyers may be knowledgeable about the areas of law in which they specialize, they sometimes have a limited understanding of why people do not seek legal advice from a lawyer and, consequently, a limited understanding of the type of legal assistance needed by those who never consult a lawyer. They also infrequently have a comprehensive understanding of the types of legal assistance that alternative legal advocates, ALAs, can provide. Furthermore, attorneys generally do not inquire whether and to what extent the current laws make it difficult for vulnerable individuals to acquire the legal assistance they desperately need. In North Carolina, the voices of existing and potential users of legal services have yet to be invited into any serious conversations regarding unmet legal needs and the need for regulatory reform. However, public service workers and advocates encounter individuals with unmet legal needs daily. Many community leaders, social workers, paralegals, law enforcement officers, court clerks, faith-based advocates, culturally specific advocates, and others know from daily experience that the current civil justice system is failing. Additionally, judges routinely have a front row seat to the many issues that arise with self-represented litigants. SRLs might fail to file necessary and complete documents or be unprepared to argue their case in the allotted time. They also frequently place judges in the difficult position of balancing fairness with impartiality, leaving unsuccessful litigants feeling bewildered and mistreated. These difficulties persist partly because the current regulatory structure prevents capable individuals from offering legal services to those who cannot afford to hire a lawyer. However, the current system also stifles innovation and restricts lawyers' ability to extend services in quantity and quality. Although many lawyers do great work as advocates and experts in their field, there is no meaningful incentive to provide affordable services because they control the market in which they operate. As a result, the vast majority of the public is compelled to pay impossibly high prices or figure out how to resolve their legal problems alone. For many North Carolinians, the outcome of self-representation has irreversible and disastrous life-changing consequences. North Carolina Constitution Article 1, Section 18 states, in part, right and justice shall be administered impartially, without denial, discrimination, or delay. However, 
According to the 2016 Interim Report of the Public Trust and Confidence Committee, a committee of the former North Carolina Commission on the Administration of Law and Justice, 73% of North Carolina respondents did not believe that most people could afford to file a lawsuit. Moreover, 76% of poll respondents felt that those without legal representation are treated somewhat or much worse in court. Substantial work is required to increase public confidence and equal access to the courts. The status quo has been insufficient to increase public trust. Changes to North Carolina General Statute Section 84, Unauthorized Practice of Law, would enable ALAs to offer meaningful services to the public, particularly those who cannot afford legal services as they currently exist. Reports from national organizations such as the American Bar Association and the Legal Services Corporation, as well as jurisdiction-specific reports such as the Legal Professionalism Committee Report and North Carolina's 2021 Civil Legal Needs Assessment, all discussed in the complete policy analysis, provide abundant evidence of the legal profession's continuing ethical and market failures and being accessible to those in need of legal services. This is also a government failure because the government's current regulatory policies allow the harmful and unnatural monopoly on legal service delivery to continue. To improve our civil justice system, we examine the current policy set forth in North Carolina General Statute Section 84, Unauthorized Practice of Law, against four policy alternatives. 1. Licensing legal practitioners, reducing fees for services. 2. Liberalizing North Carolina General Statute Section 84, Unauthorized Practice of Law, for legal aid and pro bono services. 3. Creating a legal regulatory sandbox. And 4. Establishing a court navigator program. We further assess these five policies in terms of their capability of meeting the following four goals, economic efficiency, social equity, political feasibility, and legitimacy. As you consider the policy analysis and recommendations below, keep in mind that this writing is also a petition for redress of grievances. This crisis in access to justice is a crisis for our democracy, which we implore our lawmakers to remedy. Introduction When thinking about access to justice and the civil justice system, many people envision lawyers, judges, and courtrooms. However, the access to justice crisis transcends the legal system and its lawyers, impacting every human being to varying degrees. Amidst the growing problem of inequity and marginalization, access to justice remains severely constrained. Despite the valiant and tremendous efforts of private, legal aid, and pro bono attorneys, the fact remains that only some people with only some types of legal issues receive a just resolution. In addition, meaningful access to our civil justice system is systemically inequitable. According to Dr. Rebecca Sandifer, professor at Arizona State University and faculty fellow at the American Bar Foundation, certain groups of people have more meaningful access to our civil justice system than others. For example, the affluent and the white typically have more meaningful access to our civil justice system than people of limited means and people of color. Additionally, other populations are underserved, even relative to the larger population of low-income people needing civil legal services. These populations include veterans, seniors, people with disabilities, and Native Americans. Despite this common knowledge, state leaders and lawyers, many of whom are one and the same, have yet to implement strategies outside the status quo to alleviate this crisis. An increasing amount of evidence, which will be discussed below, shows that the help of an attorney is not needed to resolve every legal issue. When we place legal problems on a spectrum from relatively simple to highly complex, we begin to see a wide range of options for meeting the legal needs of those who desperately need help. When we focus on the future rather than the past, we can start to create a legal system accessible to the people it is meant to serve. Although this legislative proposal may seem novel to some, the quest for regulatory change in the legal profession is not new. For decades, scholars and practitioners have disputed the effectiveness of the current regulatory structure of the practice of law. Ranging from the restrictions on the unauthorized practice of law, UPL, to the ethical constraints within which lawyers must operate. While all of these efforts are essential, for the crisis and access to justice to be fully resolved, we must look beyond lawyers, self-help centers, legal aid, and pro bono to meet the public's legal needs. We must take a fresh look at the access to justice crisis and be willing to evaluate and implement innovative solutions. Below is an analysis of some deficiencies in our legal system and recommendations for improving it. Recent reports on civil legal needs. The Justice Gap, the Unmet Civil Legal Needs of Low-Income Americans, 2022. In April 2022, Legal Services Corporation, LSC, a 501c3 nonprofit organization established by the United States Congress that provides funding for civil legal aid across the nation, released its most recent Justice Gap report. The report stated that 92% of low-income Americans with civil legal issues received no legal assistance, and 74% of low-income households had at least one civil court incident in the preceding year. An Assessment of the Civil Legal Needs of North Carolina, 2021. Additionally, according to the North Carolina Equal Access to Justice Commission, in 2018, more than 2 million North Carolinians qualified for legal aid, those with incomes at or below 125% of the federal poverty line. In this low-income population, they noted that 71% of families would encounter at least one civil legal issue a year. Despite this, they estimated that an astounding 86% of these legal issues would go unresolved due to the inadequate resources available to legal aid providers. 
Moreover, they reported that civil legal issues affect fundamental human needs, including housing, health care, safety, economic stability, and family structure. Finally, they imparted that legal representation for domestic violence, divorce, child custody, housing, consumer protection, employment, veterans benefits, and health is essential. With this understanding, in 2020, the Center for Housing and Community Studies at UNC Greensboro, the North Carolina Equal Access to Justice Commission, and the Equal Justice Alliance completed the first comprehensive civil legal needs assessment since 2003. Their report, In Pursuit of Justice, an assessment of the civil legal needs of North Carolina, June 2021, North Carolina's 2021 civil legal needs assessment, gives an overview of civil legal needs in North Carolina as well as the severity and kind of civil legal difficulties faced. The report highlights a marked failure in meeting the civil legal needs of North Carolinians with modest incomes. According to legal service providers, there is not enough capacity to serve everyone. As discussed above, middle-income residents who are ineligible for assistance due to their income level are also among those with unmet needs. According to the report, researchers asked respondents to name the greatest barriers. By far, the most frequent was costs, which 91.2% identified, as seen in Figure 1. Figure 1 the barriers to seeking assistance with civil legal issues, 2020. Nearly 1.7 million civil legal cases of 26 civil issue types during 2015-2019 underscore the needs of North Carolina's low-income communities. More than half of all cases annually are housing-related, for summary ejectments, 46%, and foreclosures, 10%. Family-related civil legal issues accounted for about 30% of the total volume annually. They included divorce, 10%, domestic violence, 9%, custody issues, 5%, no-contact orders, 3%, restraining orders, 1%, and temporary custody orders, 1%. Note that the data for this report was collected from 2015 to 2019. Therefore, the statistics represented in the report constitute pre-pandemic numbers. The impact of the pandemic has exacerbated civil access to justice concerns. In the 2021 Civil Legal Needs Report, the areas of greatest legal need are outlined in Figure 2 and Figure 3 below. Figure 2, 10 most prevalent civil case types of the 26 selected case types statewide. Figure 3's top needs identified by nonprofit legal aid providers, 2020. Factors contributing to the access to justice crisis. On the outside of the United States Supreme Court building are the words, equal justice under law, which are meant to represent the guiding concept of the American legal system. After over 225 years, the United States has yet to realize this principle. Below are some factors contributing to the civil access to justice crisis in North Carolina. However, this list of factors is not exhaustive. For the sake of brevity, many factors, such as education and language barriers, were excluded from this analysis but nonetheless have an impact on the access to justice gap. Knowledge without action, complacency in the legal profession. Commission on the Administration of Law and Justice. In 2015, former Chief Justice Mark Martin established the North Carolina Commission on the Administration of Law and Justice to thoroughly evaluate our judicial system and make recommendations for strengthening our courts within the existing administrative framework. The commission was divided into five subcommittees to investigate different aspects of the justice system. One, civil justice. Two, criminal investigation and adjudication. Three, legal professionalism. Four, public trust and confidence. And five, technology. The outstanding work of the commission provided a starting point for dialogue between the judicial branch and the General Assembly to serve the people of North Carolina better and live up to the high standard of an effective and efficient judicial system. A series of reports detailing the commission's final findings and recommendations were delivered to Chief Justice Martin and made public in the first few months of 2017. This analysis focuses on the Legal Professionalism Committee report. After more than a year of careful study, the Legal Professionalism Committee made several recommendations. First, it recommended the creation of a North Carolina Innovation Center and that it studies possible updates to North Carolina General Statute Section 84, Unauthorized Practice of Law, to address the changing nature of legal services. It also suggested studying proposed changes to the definition of the practice of law and the entities with authority to change that definition. Additionally, it recommended that the Innovation Center study whether North Carolina should license or certify any additional categories of legal service providers and, if so, address how these providers should be regulated. The commission dissolved in 2017. Although actions were taken on some of the excellent recommendations made by the commission, example, e-filing court documents, raise the age, no meaningful action was taken on those recommendations. North Carolina State Bar's Issues Subcommittee on Regulatory Change The North Carolina State Bar is managed by a 61-member council of attorneys elected by other attorneys in their home communities. Three non-attorney council members are appointed by the governor and other elected authorities to represent the public's interests. The North Carolina State Bar states, protection of the public and protection of our system of justice are the objectives of regulation. The North Carolina State Bar acknowledges that legal services are out of reach for low- and middle-income populations. Its preamble to the rules of professional conduct states, in part, the following. 
6. As a public citizen, a lawyer should seek improvement of the law, access to the legal system, the administration of justice, and the quality of service rendered by the legal profession. A lawyer should be mindful of deficiencies in the administration of justice and of the fact that the poor, and sometimes persons who are not poor, cannot afford adequate legal assistance. Therefore, all lawyers should devote professional time and resources and use civic influence to ensure equal access to our system of justice for all those who, because of economic or social barriers, cannot afford or secure adequate legal counsel. A lawyer should aid the legal profession in pursuing these objectives and should help the bar regulate itself in the public interest. 27 NC Admin. Code 2.0.1. Preamble. To that end, in January 2020, the State Bar Council's Issues Subcommittee on Regulatory Change Subcommittee was created and charged with researching ongoing efforts in the United States and abroad to examine and propose potential changes to the regulatory structure of the legal profession, with an emphasis on how such changes might enhance access to justice. The subcommittee had the following purpose statement. Several states have adopted or proposed substantial changes to the structure of legal practice and delivery of legal services. This subcommittee will review and discuss these changes, with a focus on the actual impact these changes have had on lawyers and clients. We will consider how these changes may impact North Carolina and whether any of the changes should be considered for implementation in North Carolina. The subcommittee expects to issue one or more reports summarizing and assessing regulatory changes in other states. It does not plan to recommend specific changes for adoption by the Council. Between June 2020 and December 2021, the subcommittee held 12 meetings. Access to justice, generally understood to include both access to an adequate level of legal services and access to a fair and efficient legal system or settlement process, was the key issue in the subcommittee's investigation and subsequent debates. The subcommittee met regularly for approximately two hours per meeting to discuss specific regulatory change initiatives and to hear from experts across the United States and Canada on how to enhance the quality of legal services through new approaches. Subcommittee members, including the co-founders of the North Carolina Justice for All project, also heard updates concerning ongoing efforts to discuss and implement regulatory change in other jurisdictions. During this period, the subcommittee was confronted with the severity of the access to justice gap and resolved to make recommendations to alleviate the crisis despite their initial charge to only study these issues. In January 2022, the subcommittee published its report, Issues Subcommittee on Regulatory Change, Report and Recommendations. The subcommittee recommended the following. Pursue a limited license for non-lawyers paraprofessionals. Pursue a regulatory sandbox. Recommend a court navigators program to the administrative office of the courts. Refrain from pursuing alternative admission to the bar at this time. Explore necessary changes to permit alternative business structures and fee sharing with non-lawyers. Explore the possible liberalization of the unauthorized practice of law statutes. The subcommittee's only unanimous vote was to recommend that the state bar council pursue the development and eventual implementation of a separate license for qualified non-lawyers to provide legal services. According to the report, the subcommittee was persuaded, in part, by the presentation of the North Carolina Justice for All project that proposed a license structure for paralegals and other non-lawyers to provide limited legal services based upon successful qualification through rigorous education and examination standards. On July 21, 2022, after nearly 18 months of study by the Issues Subcommittee on Regulatory Change, the North Carolina State Bar created a Standing Access to Justice Committee to study further the subcommittee's recommendations. The new Access to Justice Committee held its first meeting on October 19, 2022, and will, purportedly, meet four times a year. It has the following charge. Access to Justice Committee. It shall be the duty of the Access to Justice Committee to study and to recommend to the Council programs and initiatives that respond to the profession's responsibility. Set forth in the preamble to the rules of professional conduct, to ensure equal access to our system of justice for all those who, because of economic or social barriers, cannot afford or secure adequate legal counsel. Despite the creation of this new Access to Justice Committee, the North Carolina State Bar has indicated at several meetings that they do not want to pursue initiatives that require legislative approval. Most recently, at an executive committee meeting on October 20th, 2022, they mentioned that they don't necessarily want to go to the legislature right now, if anything. It's just what can we do within the confines of these walls or with the help of the Chief Justice? Since regulatory reform requires action by the state legislature, it does not appear that the North Carolina State Bar intends to actively pursue any policy alternatives that require a change to North Carolina General Statute Section 84, Unauthorized Practice of Law. Notwithstanding the above charge, the 2017 recommendations made by the Legal Professionalism Committee of the North Carolina Commission on the Administration of Law and Justice, instituted by Chief Justice Mark Martin, 2014 to 2019, and the 2021 recommendations made by the North Carolina State Bar's Issues Subcommittee on Regulatory Change, the legal profession has not taken meaningful action to mitigate the access to justice gap. Instead, the status quo seems to be to protect the profession, advocate for more government funding of legal aid, and encourage more pro bono work for those in need. While we certainly do not disagree about the importance of legal aid and pro bono services, these options alone are insufficient to resolve the access to justice crisis. Below are several other factors contributing to this crisis.
Limitations of Legal Aid of North Carolina, LANC, and other legal aid providers. A second factor impacting the access to justice crisis involves the limited resources of legal aid of North Carolina. Legal aid workers deal with some of society's most fundamental problems. They are overwhelmed with heavy caseloads. They take on the emotional burden of their clients' problems. They bear the psychological toll of unpredictable funding and job security. While the legal aid program is not perfect, workers continue to provide people whom the civil justice system often disregards with a sense of dignity and self-worth. It is often because of their hard work that justice becomes a reality. In 2019, 18.2% of North Carolina's population, 1,859,610 people, were eligible for LANC services. LANC employs 250 lawyers and 525 staff members and serves over 40,000 people yearly. In addition, there is only one legal aid attorney for every 8,000 North Carolinians who qualify for legal services, compared to one private attorney for every 358 North Carolinians. LANC, 2018, reports that, even when income requirements are met, it can only serve 1 in 10 households due to insufficient financial and human resources. COVID-19 has only worsened these outcomes. Unfortunately, legal aid is not an option for many people who need legal help. To qualify for legal aid of North Carolina's LANC services, an individual's income must be less than $16,100 for an individual and $33,125 for a family of four. Income eligibility thresholds are 125% of the 2021 federal poverty guidelines set by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. To put this in perspective, currently, under the Fair Labor Standards Act, FLSA, employers are required to pay $7.25 an hour, which comes to about $15,080 annually. Therefore, one cannot qualify for legal aid unless their income is near minimum wage. Limitations of pro bono legal services. A third factor is the issue of pro bono legal services. Pro bono attorneys are noble and critical, sharing many of the same characteristics as legal aid providers. However, they cannot resolve the indisputably large access to justice crisis alone. In 2016, Gillian Hatfield, director at schwartz Reisman Institute for Technology and Society at the University of Toronto, analyzed this data in detail. These were the findings. According to legal needs surveys conducted at the state level in 2016, 62% of households in America have at least one legal problem and, on average, have three total. So, if you take into consideration that there are 125 million households in the U.S., that means there are roughly 232.5 million legal problems in the U.S. at any given time. Next, Hatfield looked at what it would cost to fix all these problems. The average hourly rate of a non-corporate lawyer is $200, $250. Therefore, at $200 an hour, on the conservative side of this range, it would cost $46.5 billion to provide just one hour of legal help to all the households in America currently facing legal problems. If every single one of the 1.3 million licensed lawyers in the U.S. were to take on all these problems, they'd each have to put in 180 pro bono hours, about 1.5 months of work. The current average amount of pro bono hours is 55, but that is among the 52% who provided such services in 2016 a far cry from the 100% participation rate we would need to address these problems fully. The need for legal services is too great to be met only through pro bono work, and the reason is not that attorneys do not care or are unwilling to help. It is a systemic issue. While lawyers donating part of their time to help those of limited means is honorable and should continue, the public would fare better if they also had access to a market where they could negotiate for the needed services. Many would be better served by using the services of, for example, a licensed legal practitioner, rather than relying on a lawyer's pro gratis services. The latter may volunteer hours for brief advice and counsel. However, pro bono attorneys are rarely available to see a matter through from inception to conclusion, particularly in family law and immigration matters which can take years and are the two highest needs in the state, according to the 2021 Civil Legal Needs Assessment. Furthermore, legal practitioners that would be licensed to practice in specific practice areas, such as family law, would be more knowledgeable in that area than a well-meaning lawyer who volunteers their time but knows little about family law. Many paralegals who would be appropriate as legal practitioners have years of expertise in the field and are frequently required to complete specific family law courses and examinations that lawyers are not. Furthermore, expanding the number of legal service providers expands the pool of prospective pro bono volunteers available to serve the public. Limited options for the missing middle. A fourth factor is the lack of alternatives available to the middle income population in case of a legal dispute. Many members of the middle income population do not have enough disposable income to afford a lawyer when they have a legal problem and do not meet the low income requirements to receive free legal assistance. This population is frequently referred to as the missing middle because it is often disregarded. The North Carolina 2021 Civil Legal Needs Assessment notes, on page 37, the following. For those who are turned away based on income eligibility, the alternatives are not good. One respondent identified this as an underserved subpopulation. 
That middle income group of 200% to 400% of the federal poverty level. Folks who don't qualify for legal aid, but also can't pay a $10,000 retainer, they're out of luck. So, when we asked our informants what they do with applicants whom they must turn away because of income ineligibility, we were met with pessimism. One mentioned the lawyer referral service of the North Carolina Bar Association, saying the service is extremely limited. There's only a few hundred attorneys who are even members of that service, and they don't cover a wide range of practice areas, and to be quite honest, I'm not sure that they can handle the volume of referrals that come their way. Some organizations keep internal referral lists, but they don't yield better results. One lawyer told us, we have a referral list. A lot of times, I feel bad using it. It's like pointing to another overwhelmed nonprofit or direct services group that may not have a whole lot more bandwidth than we do. A lawyer summarized the access problem. So we do see the gap as far as just people needing representation and not having the money to pay a private attorney five figures. Estimating the size of the missing middle population in North Carolina. As discussed above, Legal Aid of North Carolina's LANC income cap for legal assistance is $16,100 for one person and $33,125 for a family of four. While the legal need at this level is significant, many more have annual earnings above that income cap and cannot afford a lawyer. An article titled, Why Do Blue States Keep Prioritizing Lawyers Over Low-Income Americans? Noted that with full-price lawyers as their only option, and even inexperienced lawyers charging more than $300 per hour, most Americans are priced out of the market for legal help. To better understand the size of North Carolina's missing middle, we estimated it using data from several sources. As of April 1, 2020, North Carolina's population was 10,439,388. Of this population, 53% were considered middle income, with incomes ranging from $24,840 to $120,447. Median income was $60,768. The American Bar Association and the Institute for the Advancement of the American Legal System report that 40% to 60% of middle income legal needs go unmet nationally using this information. It is calculated that between 2,213,150, or 21.2%, to 3,319,725, or 31.8%, of middle income North Carolinians have unmet legal needs due to the cost of legal services. This is an average of 2,766,438, or 26.5% of the population. As seen in Figure 4, this population is even larger than the population that qualifies for free legal services from Legal Aid of North Carolina. Many in this population have the ability to pay something for legal services, but not the high rates attorneys charge. Figure 4 of comparing population eligible for LANC with missing middle. Note, the missing middle cannot afford a lawyer when they have a legal problem and do not meet the low-income requirements to receive free legal assistance. Legal deserts. A fifth factor is the issue of legal deserts. A legal desert is a geographic area with less than one lawyer for every 1,000 residents. There are 30,000 attorneys in North Carolina. According to the 2022 ABA profile of the legal profession, North Carolina has 2.0, 2.9 attorneys per 1,000 people. Below are some facts related to North Carolina, as provided by the North Carolina State Bar, in response to a public records request. 48 of North Carolina's 100 counties qualify as a legal desert. Lawyers are largely concentrated in urban counties. 46.7% of active, in-state North Carolina lawyers are in two counties, Wake and Mecklenburg. 63% of active, in-state North Carolina lawyers are in five counties, Wake, Mecklenburg, Guilford, Durham, and Forsyth. There is a concentration of attorneys in Wilmington, Mecklenburg County, the Research Triangle, and the Triad. However, in 10 of North Carolina's 100 counties, there are fewer than 10 attorneys. Note that the data on lawyer population by county likely overstates the number of active lawyers practicing in a particular county. This is because many retired or non-practicing lawyers in legal desert counties maintain an active license despite closing their practices. The lack of options in these counties further aggravates the access to justice crisis. Some factors impacting legal deserts include the high cost of law school and a general preference for living in metropolitan areas. For example, the American Bar Association and Access Lex Institute estimate that the typical law school graduate will have amassed over $130,000 in debt from educational loans. Many new graduates of law school find that their annual income falls short of their overall loan obligations, so graduates are lured, in part, to urban areas because higher salaries tend to be offered there. Additionally, law school graduates generally find working in metropolitan areas more attractive than working in rural or economically depressed areas the same areas designated as legal deserts. Some factors driving younger lawyers to metropolitan areas include the prestige of working at a more prominent firm, access to high-speed internet, example, Netflix, Hulu. Proximity to shopping and entertainment options, other conveniences, example, Amazon, food delivery, and housing shortages. On December 16, 2022, the North Carolina State Bar Subcommittee Studying Legal Deserts acknowledged that law schools confirmed graduates are remiss to even move to areas such as Winston-Salem. They prefer, instead, to settle in areas such as Raleigh or Charlotte.
There have been many discussions in the legal community concerning options for alleviating legal deserts in North Carolina. For example, during a presentation by Margaret Sauer, director of the DHHS Office of Rural Health, at a subcommittee studying legal deserts meeting on December 16, 2022. Sauer indicated that medical professionals in rural areas typically need two jobs to make ends meet. She suggested this option for attorneys willing to practice in rural areas. She also indicated that the medical field leverages other medical professionals, i.e. nurse practitioners, to fill in some of their health professional shortage areas, HPSA, and asked the subcommittee whether paralegals were an option to address their legal deserts. One subcommittee member informed Sauer that there are no lawyer mid-levels. So you made reference earlier to, you know, these people who do this that lawyers typically do, so we don't have mid-levels, we don't have PAs, we don't have nurse practitioners, that's a whole nother discussion that's occurring at the state bar. But we don't have that. Experts concur that the shortage of rural attorneys is unlikely to improve over the next decade. Technology. Access to technology. A sixth factor is the issue of technology. Despite the undeniable importance of technology in supporting access to justice, there are key factors to consider, such as the availability of technology and the expectation of access to that technology. According to the North Carolina Department of Information Technology, at least 1.1 million out of 4.032 million households in North Carolina lack access to high-speed internet due to a lack of funds, education, or both. Self-represented parties without internet access are also unlikely to have access to other types of technology, such as printers and scanners. These problems undermine the accessibility of programs intended to close the access to justice gap. Without internet access, for example, it is impossible to use tools such as eCourts Guide and File, a free online program that assists users in drafting court documents for specific types of cases. Limitations of technology. Additionally, there are other types of limitations even when self-represented parties have access to computers and the internet. For example, the North Carolina Equal Access to Justice Commission gave a presentation on eCourts Guide and File on February 19, 2021. Between September 2020, when the system became available, and the date of their report, the commission reported 20,000 users. 4,000 users completed the interview process to generate documents. The commission noted a drop of 80% between the number of users and the number of completed interviews and explained that eCourts Guide and File nudges users to seek legal advice when forms do not meet their legal needs. Although some users were likely curious about the new system without needing its services, a drop-off of 16,000 users may mean many people need additional support even when they have access to technology. For example, legal technology like Guide and File does not conduct a what-if analysis or Monte Carlo simulation and instruct people on what actions to take given the infinite number of potential variables involved in their cases. Individuals frequently still need an experienced human brain to help them research legal questions, draft persuasive arguments, prepare for trial, and negotiate settlements. Given that information, we must consider technology's limitations in addressing the access to justice crisis. Legal advocacy and technology. Also, there are many situations where human-to-human -human interactions would be difficult to replicate through technology. For example, in a North Carolina General Statute Section 50B, domestic violence, or child custody action, self-represented parties would benefit from having someone to help them understand the legal process, clarify and prioritize their legal goals, and help them temper their desired outcomes with reasonable expectations, especially when they are emotionally distraught. Furthermore, some people prefer to speak with a live person. Not everyone trusts technology in the same way they do humans. While scalable technological innovations in the legal field are essential, they are not a silver bullet for our access to justice problem. One-to-one -one interactions remain important in people law. North Carolina's literacy rates. A seventh factor is adult literacy rates. When taking a holistic view of individuals and the access to justice gap, the issue of functional literacy becomes extremely important. Functional literacy is the collection of practical skills required to read, write, and perform mathematics for real-world applications so that individuals can operate successfully in their communities. North Carolina has a 13.6% functional illiteracy rate. That means roughly one in seven people in North Carolina struggle to read and comprehend well enough to advocate effectively for themselves, particularly before a court or tribunal. Many individuals struggle with receptive and expressive language skills and other concerns that impact effective communication. These barriers make it difficult to adequately articulate their legal position even with the best technology. Measuring the demand for legal services. An eighth factor is the inability to accurately assess all aspects of legal need. Measuring the demand for legal services is more complex than defining the need because most individuals will not seek legal assistance due to other systemic issues, such as the expense of court, the inconvenience of legal proceedings, or a lack of knowledge about available options. These civil legal needs will remain unfulfilled unless a significant regulatory change occurs to compensate for the limited resources available to legal aid and pro bono providers. Current policy, a combined market and government failure. North Carolina General Statute Section 84, unauthorized practice of law, has a stranglehold on the delivery of legal services, which is reflected in the access to justice issue, and limits new routes to accessible legal services, leaving consumers with few options. 
With limited exceptions, anyone other than an attorney who provides legal services engages in the unlicensed practice of law and is subject to punishment, regardless of whether their services genuinely benefit consumers. Moreover, as discussed previously, while legal aid services and pro bono work are essential to addressing the issue of access to justice, they alone are insufficient. Professional groups often seek protection from open market competition by lobbying for laws and regulations that provide them an advantage. They contend that competition is healthy in other fields, but not in theirs. They lobby for rules and laws ostensibly to safeguard the public against ineptitude. For many, the end goal is protecting their trade, and they can succeed for as long as they have the government's support. In a free market, consumers' decisions determine what products or services are in demand. However, when one group is permitted to limit competition, its members reap the benefits while the rest of society pays a high price. Given the legal industry's privileged position in shaping legislation, it is not surprising that lawyers remain one of the last professions to maintain a monopoly. The legal industry has established internal obstacles against competition through UPL regulation and Rule 5.4 professional independence of a lawyer. These laws, as written, protect attorneys from the competition of unlicensed individuals who may have some legal expertise, but they do not protect the public. In light of the access to justice crisis and considering the economics and ethics involved, we conclude that there is no justification for keeping North Carolina General Statute Section 84, unauthorized practice of law, as written, in place. Common Arguments Against Regulatory Reform Unauthorized practice of law statutes are primarily based on the belief that no one can help another person with a legal problem until they have completed three years of law school and passed the bar exam. To put it another way, the law in North Carolina presumes that the only way to obtain the knowledge necessary to assist others with legal problems is to attend law school and memorize the subset of law assessed on bar exams. This is an unreasonable assumption. Law school alumni may be familiar with several legal areas, but still need guidance when handling issues independently. For example, family law is one of the most significant areas of legal need. Many attorneys establish successful family law practices after taking only one family law class as an elective in law school. However, since family law is not a required course in law school and is not among the core subjects tested on the bar examination, numerous other lawyers pass the bar exam and set up family law practices utilizing only the information they gained in a bar review course on family law. In fact, according to the National Conference of Bar Examiners, the new bar exam, debuting in 2026, will no longer cover conflict of laws, family law, trusts and estates, or secured transactions. Once an attorney begins practicing law, they typically focus on a specific area. Studying the law in depth at law school is important, but it is also not absolutely necessary in every circumstance. Just as much may be learned about the law outside of law school as in it. In fact, until the 1930s, law school was not required in most jurisdictions. The vast majority of lawyers instead acquired their craft through apprenticeship. Many successful lawyers, including everyone from Abraham Lincoln and John Marshall to Clarence Darrow and Robert Story, Sr., pursued apprenticeships. Additionally, California, Vermont, Virginia, and Washington offer full lawyer apprenticeship programs. When complete, lawyers can practice in any area of law. Public harm? Prove it. One common argument against regulatory reform is public harm the concern that unqualified and dishonest actors might exploit the poor if UPL laws were relaxed. Even though the current system offers no protection to those currently harmed, such as the large population that faces legal crises without any legal assistance, Opponents of these new pathways and new providers will point to the dangers these innovations could bring and the potential harm to the public. Nevertheless, studies show that the number of complaints concerning harm filed in every other jurisdiction where the policy alternatives we analyzed have been tried is less than or equal to those against lawyers. For example, in January 2021, Dave Byers, the Administrative Director of Arizona Courts, reported to the North Carolina State Bar's Issues Subcommittee on Regulatory Change, Subcommittee, that Arizona had had legal document preparers, LDPs, for more than 15 years. He said they are making a difference in Arizona and that there are LDPs he would like to clone because of their impact on their communities. Dave Byers also said that the LDP program has been so successful in Arizona that they would begin licensing legal paraprofessionals in spring 2021, and they did. Legal paraprofessionals have more autonomy than LDPs in that they can appear in court, among other things. Moreover, Byers informed the subcommittee that Arizona modeled its program on Ontario's licensed paralegal program, which began in 2007, and that Ontario's 3,700 active paralegals and 38,000 active lawyers are thriving. Ontario confirmed the relative success of their program on March 23, 2021. Additionally, the licensed paralegal practitioner, LPP, program was established as a standalone legal profession in Utah in 2015. With the primary objectives of helping Utah's growing number of self-represented litigants and establishing a niche for a new type of legal practitioner, the LPP program at the Utah State Bar has expanded gradually but steadily since it first began offering a licensing exam in 2019. For the last inquiry in December 2022, Utah reports no complaints regarding harm concerning their LPPs. 
Moreover, despite Washington's highly controversial and politicized reasons for subsidizing its limited licensing, called Limited License Legal Technician or LLLT program, harm has never been named as a reason for the Washington Supreme Court to sunset its program. In fact, in 2021, even after Washington decided to sunset its LLLT program, the Stanford Center on the Legal Profession called Washington's program a success and made recommendations for other states considering licensing programs. Finally, there is no outcry of harm at the federal court level in areas where ALAs are permitted to represent clients. For example, an accredited representative is a non-attorney who has demonstrated to the Department of Justice that they have enough education and experience in immigration law to provide immigration legal services. As another example, an individual can have a non-attorney representative assist with Social Security Administration claims. The representative, if approved, may even accept money in advance if the money is held in a trust or escrow account. Practicing law? Tax preparers, insurance agents, and real estate agents. Additionally, consider other industries with professionals who are arguably practicing law. The U.S. tax code is one example of an area of law that is highly complex and requires extensive study to comprehend fully. Nevertheless, North Carolina is one of 46 states that does not require a license for independent tax preparers, many of whom put out a shingle during tax season despite having no official education or experience in understanding the 74,000 pages of U.S. tax code, federal tax regulations, and official tax guidance. Many are trained in an approximately 60-hour course to file legal documents, i.e., tax returns, both state and federal. If the tax return is too complex, the option exists to retain a CPA also unlicensed. If needed, an individual also has the option to seek the assistance of a tax attorney. Consider real estate agents. In North Carolina, per North Carolina General Statute Section 93A4, a, individuals must complete a 75-hour pre-licensing course before applying for a license. They must pass an exam and find a sponsor but do not need a college education. Afterward, they must complete three post-licensing courses within 18 months of initial licensure to retain eligibility to actively engage in real estate brokerage. Each post-licensing course must consist of a minimum of 30 instructional hours. Although there is much discussion within the real estate industry about how to avoid violating UPL statutes, as a practical matter, a realtor can practice law by choosing, filling out, and even supplementing standardized forms. They also frequently draft contracts for residential real estate, the most significant purchase most people will ever make. While doing their job, they are held to a standard of care like an attorney. If any layperson were to complete court forms for a self-represented litigant by choosing, filling out, and supplementing standardized forms, it would undoubtedly be considered a violation of the current UPL statutes. Finally, insurance agents interpret contracts regularly and advise their clients accordingly. The agent also determines the potential risks associated with an entity or individual and specifies what appropriate coverages are available in the marketplace. Based on information collected from their clients, agents can bind their companies to risk, issue endorsements, and do other things that could be considered the practice of law. The bottom line is that certain domains of the law can be learned and applied relatively easily. Drafting many legal documents can be done successfully by someone with less than three years of law school, as paralegals and other professionals discussed above are already doing. These professionals do not have a law license, and public harm has not been an issue. Concerns about creating second-rate legal help. Available options, a lawyer or no help at all. An argument leveraged against licensing legal practitioners, in particular, is that it would give the impression of trying to appease those in the access to justice gap with a second-tier professional something less than an attorney. However, there is no literature or data to support that the public feels this way in any of the states where limited licensing presently exists. There are, instead, many reasons to believe that the public would embrace legal practitioners. For example, a 2020 public opinion survey completed in Arizona indicated that the public would welcome assistance from someone who is not a lawyer. Further, there are plenty of examples in other professions. No one quibbles over a local tax preparer not being a tax attorney or CPA. No one scoffs at a realtor who is not a contract lawyer. There is also no general outcry from the public that medical care is inadequate when they are treated by a nurse practitioner instead of a medical doctor. A person in danger of drowning off the coast of North Carolina would not turn down the assistance of a skilled swimmer because they are waiting for the expertise of the U.S. Coast Guard. When a person is drowning, they want help from whoever has the knowledge and skill to assist them. Right now, the only options for many drowning North Carolinians are an attorney they cannot afford or nothing. Moreover, notwithstanding the penalties imposed by NC General Stat. 84. Unauthorized practice of law. A significant number of individuals receive legal counsel from family and friends, and many times terrible legal counsel. The problem, then, is not in providing the public with the option to select a qualified and more cost-effective alternative legal service provider, but in denying them any other choice. While it is unlikely that a client's experience will be successful every time, an unachievable bar that no lawyer has cleared. It is safe to assume that the vast majority of legal matters will be resolved to everyone's satisfaction and that many more people will have access to legal services at significantly reduced costs than they do now. Public harm and second-rate legal help are pretexts for two unfounded concerns.
In the end, opposition to regulatory reforms that would relax the unauthorized practice of law, UPL, statutes to mitigate the ever-widening access to justice gap is based on one of two major concerns. Either lawyers lack faith in the public's intelligence and agency as individuals, or they lack confidence in their own abilities to thrive in a competitive market. Both perspectives are unfounded. According to a report published by the National Center for State Courts and the American Bar Foundation, fear of competition from alternative legal service providers is a non-issue since those in the access to justice gap cannot afford lawyer services anyway. But, even if competition were a legitimate concern, the legal profession exists to protect the public, not itself. Further, taking away an individual's choice does not protect them. It is unjustifiable paternalism and an unwarranted interference on the liberties of people who can make their own decisions since it undermines their ability to live as they choose so long as they do not interfere with the rights of others. The above examples of law-adjacent professions show that North Carolina General Statute Section 84, Unauthorized Practice of Law, does not protect the public. Instead, these laws hinder the public from working with ALAs who want to help but have not gone through the process of becoming a lawyer. An overview of alternative policies. Other organizations and states have begun developing various ALA programs to assist those who cannot afford a lawyer. Some states have modified their UPL statutes to permit ALAs to perform limited services in specific areas of the law. The programs that have been established and those still in the planning stages have each been designed with a slightly different framework to meet the requirements of their respective jurisdictions. We analyzed four regulatory change initiatives, previously set forth above, in other jurisdictions to determine whether a particular concept A had the potential to increase access to justice and B would not lead to public harm. Policy alternative number one, license legal practitioners, reducing fees for services. A legal practitioner is a professional with specific education and experience, licensed to provide limited legal services in specific practice areas. This professional is often compared to a nurse practitioner in the medical field. Legal practitioners are not lawyers, but they can provide more affordable, limited legal advice and create legal documents for clients in certain areas of law. In some states, like Arizona, they can also appear in court. If the legal issue requires work beyond the legal practitioner's scope of practice, the legal practitioner must advise clients to seek the advice of an attorney. In considering this policy alternative, paralegals, unlicensed law school graduates, and other qualified professionals could offer limited legal services. First, we envision licensing paralegals. A paralegal is qualified by education, training, or work experience and performs substantial legal work under the direction and supervision of an attorney. Many of the tasks lawyers do, paralegals do as well. Some paralegal responsibilities include case planning, development, and management, legal research, interviewing clients, fact gathering, and retrieving information. Drafting and analyzing legal documents, collecting, compiling, and utilizing technical information to make an independent decision and recommendation to the supervising attorney. Paralegals might also represent clients before a state or federal administrative agency if that representation is permitted by statute, court rule, or administrative rule or regulation. In May 2021, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, BLS, reported 12,630 paralegals and legal assistants employed throughout North Carolina. Although we are not suggesting that newly certified paralegals are appropriate for licensure, the North Carolina State Bar reports that there are more than 3,600 North Carolina certified paralegals, NCCPs. While the six law schools in North Carolina are concentrated in the Triad and Triangle regions, the North Carolina State Bar Paralegal Certification website lists 38 paralegal programs at educational institutions throughout the state. To graduate, most programs involve courses in legal research, contract law, torts, wills, and estate planning, ethics, family law, criminal law, and real estate law. Second, we envision licensing law school graduates with a Juris Doctor degree. The North Carolina State Bar governs the Student Practice Certification Rule, formerly known as the 3L Practice Rule, which allows law students, after meeting certain requirements, to obtain practical experience in the practice of law under the supervision of a licensed attorney. However, if a law school graduate were to fail the North Carolina State Bar exam, they could no longer take advantage of that rule and would be prohibited from practicing law. North Carolina's overall bar exam passage rate is 68%. The North Carolina Board of Law Examiners reports that between 2010 and 2020, nearly 7,000 applicants took the state bar exam and did not pass. For law school students who graduate with a notoriously heavy debt load, this would provide a needed opportunity to work in the legal profession while helping the public with their legal needs. Additionally, although we have yet to research this topic thoroughly, states like New York are also considering licensing law-adjacent service providers and community workers such as social workers. Some of the areas of practice potentially appropriate for legal practitioners and voted on by the North Carolina State Bar Issues Subcommittee on Regulatory Change, discussed above, include family law, unanimous pass, landlord-tenant law, unanimous pass, housing homeowner issues, split vote pass, 11 to 1, immigration, split vote pass, 8 to 5, elder law, split vote pass, 8 to 3. 
Health care, split vote pass, 9 to 2. Income maintenance, split vote pass, 9 to 3. Consumer rights, split vote pass, 8 to 4. Employment legal services, split vote pass, 7 to 5. And veteran military benefits, split vote pass, 9 to 3. These practice areas were chosen for discussion and a vote because they had the greatest legal need, as reflected in the report, in pursuit of justice, an assessment of the civil legal needs of North Carolina, June 2021. Many of these practice areas, including family, landlord-tenant, estate planning, probate, debtor creditor administrative law, and expungements, are also identified in a comprehensive document. Proposal for a limited practice rule to narrow North Carolina's access to justice gap, submitted to the North Carolina Supreme Court and the North Carolina State Bar by the North Carolina Justice for All Project in January 2021. In particular, more resources for areas like expunctions would significantly improve individuals' prospects of being self-supporting. Current and Pending Programs in November 2022, the Institute for the Advancement of the American Legal System at the University of Denver, IAALS, published a report, The Landscape of Allied Legal Professional Programs in the United States. According to Michael Holberg, Director of Special Projects, the goals of the study were to explain why many jurisdictions have started creating a new tier of legal service providers called Allied Legal Professional or ALP in the report and to identify the similarities and differences between each. Holberg further explained that when creating their own program, many states start by researching the programs already in place in other states. This paper is meant to be utilized by states considering developing their own ALP program to get insight into what such programs entail and the rationale behind many of the decisions made by other states. The first section summarizes the access to justice crisis now confronting the United States of America. Second, the report specifies which states have implemented programs and which have plans for instituting such initiatives in the near future. The report then breaks down each critical component of an ALP framework, discussing how and why certain states' programs and plans vary. Finally, the article discusses the benefits and challenges of the current state programs. The states with activity in this area are shown below in Figure 5. Figure 5 map of state activity provided by IAALS. Policy alternative number 2, liberalizing North Carolina General Statute Section 84, unauthorized practice of law for legal aid and pro bono services. As discussed above, the definition of practicing law is outlined in North Carolina General Statute Section 84, unauthorized practice of law. While liberalizing UPL statutes can mean many different things for purposes of our policy analysis, we considered whether it would benefit the public to relax the current statutory structure and prohibitions on the practice of law for those not acting for financial or personal gain. We believe that liberalizing North Carolina General Statute Section 84, unauthorized practice of law, could create more opportunities for the non-lawyer workforce of pro bono, legal aid, and other advocacy programs to serve more people. Current Programs Delaware in January 2022, the Delaware Supreme Court adopted a new rule permitting qualified non-lawyer tenant advocates to represent residential residents in eviction cases. Rule 57 of the Supreme Court has long enabled the representation of landlords and landlord companies in eviction proceedings by non-lawyer agents, but not tenants. Rule 57.1 permits authorized tenant advocates to prosecute or defend eviction actions, engage in settlement negotiations, file pleadings, and other documents, and present before the Justice of the Peace Court with the approval of their residential tenant client. Qualified tenant advocates will be taught by one of Delaware's three legal aid agencies and will be supervised by a Delaware legal aid attorney. Alaska The Alaska Supreme Court adopted Rule 43.5, waiver to engage in the limited practice of law for non-lawyers trained and supervised by Alaska Legal Services Corporation on December 1, 2022. This rule establishes guidelines for non-lawyers to help low-income Alaskans with certain legal matters. To qualify, the person must have completed the required training provided by Alaska Legal Services Corporation on the rules of professional conduct, including, but not limited to, conflicts of interest, confidentiality, the duty of candor, the substantive area of law in which the person will practice, and appropriate tribunal procedures. The person must also be supervised by and engage in the limited practice of law exclusively for Alaska Legal Services Corporation full-time. Policy Alternative Number 3, Regulatory Sandbox. A regulatory sandbox is a policy instrument that allows for the provision of novel models or services to test their marketability and impact to influence future policymaking. The financial services sector was the first to employ the sandbox tool since it is a highly regulated business facing substantial technological breakthroughs that do not fall under the standard laws, example, cryptocurrency. This concept may seem familiar. Governor Roy Cooper signed into law H-624, the North Carolina Regulatory Sandbox Act of 2021, Sandbox Act, which established what is known as a regulatory sandbox program to encourage innovation in the development of fintech and insurtech products to be offered to consumers. The legal industry, a traditionally highly regulated sector in which the market and, in particular, services driven by technology are outpacing the traditional regulatory approach, can also benefit from the sandbox model. Current Programs According to the Utah Office of Legal Services Innovation, sandboxes provide looser rules, more data, and better policymaking. 
An example is Utah's regulatory sandbox, created in August 2020. In a legal regulatory sandbox, non-attorneys could control and invest in law companies, and rules limiting who can provide legal services would be less stringent. The goal would be to provide consumers access to a well-developed, high-quality, innovative, inexpensive, and competitive market for legal services. This goal would guide the creation and management of a sandbox. While there are many sandboxes across the nation in the categories of financial technology, blockchain, insurance technology, agriculture technology, digital medical technology, energy technology, property technology, and general sandboxes, Utah is the only state that has a legal regulatory sandbox, a process graphic explaining how Utah's legal regulatory sandbox functions can be found in Figure 6. Figure 6, a regulatory sandbox model, Utah. Notably, Arizona skipped the formation of a regulatory sandbox and, instead, eliminated Rule 5.4 in 2020, paving the way for an alternative business structure, ABS, option, which went into effect in 2021 and is permanent. Policy Alternative Number 4, Court Navigators. Trained and supervised court navigators aid unrepresented parties by providing them with general information and moral support. Guiding them through the process of obtaining and completing court forms, assisting them in maintaining an organized case file, connecting them with interpreters and other services, and outlining what to expect and the roles of each person in court. Similarly, court navigators accompany self-represented litigants to court. These court navigators are not permitted to make legal arguments in court. However, they may sit with the self-represented party and answer the judge's factual questions. Such a program in North Carolina would be highly beneficial for victims of domestic violence, parties in eviction cases, and other types of self-represented litigants. The program's design would determine whether it would require a change to current UPL statutes to be viable. Current programs. According to the report, non-lawyer navigators in state courts, an emerging consensus, as of 2019, 23 initiatives in 15 states and the District of Columbia were identified and assessed in this review of the present national landscape. An updated list of programs was published in August 2022. The study outlines the aspects of the program and provides advice for its development and implementation. The programs use navigators who work within a courthouse to offer self-represented litigants, SRLs, person-to-person -person help. Navigators in the study are individuals who do not have full legal credentials and training, i.e., a law license, and assist SRLs with fundamental civil legal difficulties. Their work does not fall under the purview of the attorney-client privilege, and they receive training through an academic program. Methodology and Analysis of Policy Alternatives the formulation, adoption, and implementation of the four policy alternatives discussed above were evaluated using a goals and alternatives matrix, GAM, and a political feasibility analysis. The policy alternatives include, 1. Licensing legal practitioners, reducing fees for services. 2. Liberalizing North Carolina General Statute Section 84, unauthorized practice of law, for legal aid and pro bono services. 3. Creating a legal regulatory sandbox. And 4. Establishing a court navigator program. The GAM is a tool that facilitates the process of prioritizing these policy alternatives objectively and transparently. This requires a multi-goal solution analysis to facilitate choice-making with a focus on policy alternatives expected to produce meaningful solutions to mitigate the access to justice crisis. Political feasibility is the extent to which stakeholders and the general public will support a policy choice. The political feasibility analysis briefly discusses the possibility of support or opposition from key stakeholder groups. Goals and Alternatives Matrix, GAM Given the presence of multiple objectives, as part of the GAM, we have integrated a multi-goal solution analysis that, one, identifies impact categories for the relevant objectives, two, projects the impact that each alternative would have on the achievement of each objective, three, assigns a quantitative and or qualitative value to the projected impacts, four, evaluates the alternatives in light of the objectives, and five, facilitates our recommendations. The four policy alternatives are outlined in Table 1 in Appendix A with four goals, economic efficiency, social equity, political feasibility, and legitimacy. Although each of these goals is important, we believe that economic efficiency, in particular, merits consideration as a social good. Not only because it correlates quite well with general welfare, but also because it is frequently undervalued in the deliberations of representative governments. Table 1 summarizes the policy options and goals, with policy options along the x-axis and goals for evaluating them along the y-axis. As reflected in Table 1, all four policy alternatives are better than the status quo, except in terms of political feasibility, discussed below. However, we emphasize that these are just estimates of how well each choice would achieve the specified goals based on the available information. The best policy alternative may change depending on how the reader values the considerations above. Nonetheless, the comparisons allow us to make reasonably educated guesses about possible outcomes. Below is a discussion of some of our findings. Economic Impact Analysis When we think about the economic impact of access to justice, we tend to focus on the benefits to the legal service provider and the client, both tangible and intangible. However, there is an economic benefit to the entire state of North Carolina in providing access to legal services for low- and middle-income individuals. These benefits include both revenue and cost savings. 
Economic benefit, revenue to NC Community College and UNC systems. One economic benefit is the revenue potential from education and training programs that would assist in bringing new service providers to market, such as legal practitioners. If data is used to guide the development of new academic programs, they will meet the public's legal needs and attract more students. By developing new academic programs or modernizing existing ones that support access to justice initiatives, the North Carolina Community Colleges system and the University of North Carolina system could better serve students, communities, and industries. Increased enrollment due to these unique programs could be marketed to both in-state and out-of-state students and produce revenue for the state. Economic benefit, cost savings to local and state economies. A second economic benefit would be cost savings to the state and local economies due to the advocacy of legal service providers. When people receive legal services, there is less need for support from homeless shelters, temporary housing programs, government welfare programs, and community programs. The funds saved can be directed to others in need. According to the North Carolina Equal Access to Justice Commission's 2012 report, a 108% return on investment, the economic impact to the state of North Carolina of civil legal services. Legal aid providers generated $16,857,503 in cost savings through client representation, including domestic violence prevention, eviction prevention, and foreclosure avoidance. The economic impact of legal services across the state, including direct, indirect, and cost savings, was $48,775,276. In 2012, for every dollar spent on legal services from all funding sources, $2.08 was returned to the economy. Specifically, for every dollar the state spent on legal services, roughly $10 was returned to the economy. The return on the state's investment in legal services provided by the three organizations detailed in the report was 108%. This report supports our position that each policy alternative discussed above can potentially have a substantial but variable positive economic impact. Analogous estimation of program costs for each policy alternative while this information is also included in Table 1, we wanted to address program costs specifically. Because the policy alternatives would be novel to North Carolina, estimating is used to assess the below program's costs. The analogous estimating technique below uses information from similar programs to establish a cost estimate based on the data available. Expert judgment is needed to confirm the data's reusability. For example, different state programs may offer varying scopes of services and commit varying degrees of funding and human resources. Legal Practitioner Programs in Washington and Utah, state bar associations fund similar programs independently. The Washington State Bar Association, WSBA, allocated less than $200,000 annually to their LLLT program, representing less than one-tenth of one percent of the WSBA's budget, in contrast. The Utah State Bar spends slightly more than $100,000 annually on its LPP program. In Arizona, the Supreme Court funds their program. Ideally, these programs will eventually be self-sustaining and paid for by the fees from the licensing programs themselves. For comparison, the NC State Bar's proposed budget for total operating costs were $9.5 million 2021. The North Carolina State Bar Board of Paralegal Certification 2021 proposed budget reflected $241,250 in revenue and $255,288.67 in expenses for 2021. Page 2 of the Executive Director's note states that the North Carolina State Bar Board of Paralegal Certification is financially self-sufficient. Liberalization of UPL programs for legal aid and pro bono services. The Delaware and Alaska programs were approved in January and December 2022, respectively. No data was immediately available online to show the cost of these programs. A public records request was sent to each state requesting this information. As of the date of this report, no information responsive to this request has been received. Regulatory Sandbox Programs a recent study on the cost of running a sandbox across industries noted a wide range in the financial resources dedicated, with figures ranging from $25,000 to over $1 million. This disparity may be attributed to the fact that some jurisdictions, but not all, included the salary of staff members dedicated to the sandbox. Most responders utilized monies from their core budgets, and just one jurisdiction indicated that application fees were levied to access the sandbox. A public records request was sent to Utah's judiciary requesting budgetary information. According to Susan Chrisman, the executive director of the Office of Legal Services Innovation, Utah's legal sandbox does not have any set budget or documents to provide. It has received approximately $350,000 in grants from sources such as the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation and the State Justice Institute to fund the startup and initial operations of the office through 2023. The judiciary is still working on long-term funding and where the office will ultimately be housed and expects to know more in 2023. Concerning North Carolina's Insurtech and Fintech Sandbox, both the North Carolina Office of State Budget and Management, OSBM, and the chair of the Innovation Council report that no funding was associated with the Sandbox when the bill passed. Also, the General Assembly did not include specific funding in the most recent budget bill outlined in the Joint Conference Committee report dated June 28, 2022. Court Navigator Programs 
Due to the fundamental differences in program structure amongst the many existing programs, it is difficult, if not impossible, to utilize available data from other programs to estimate the cost of a court navigator program in North Carolina. Existing programs vary significantly concerning a wide range of characteristics, including, but not limited to, the size of the program, the number of volunteers, nonprofit workers, and paid staff members, the type of entity overseeing the program, the collaborative network responsible for administering the program, the territory and population served, the scope of the work performed, the areas of the law addressed, and many others. Additionally, according to Mary E. McClemont, Senior Fellow, Justice Lab, Georgetown Law, these programs are funded in myriad ways, including through federal, state, and local organizations like AmeriCorps, private foundations, state bars, courts, and others. Therefore, we do not attempt to extrapolate the costs associated with the available programs across the nation for programmatic implementation in North Carolina. Instead, we provide a few cost examples from the District of Columbia, California, New Hampshire, and suggest reviewing McClemont's 2019 report, Non-Lawyer Navigators in State Courts. An emerging consensus, a survey of the national landscape of non-lawyer navigator programs in state courts assisting self-represented litigants, specifically the Section Subhead C, Program Funding and Structural Support, PP, 29-31. We requested budgetary information regarding New York's court navigator program and are still awaiting a response. Evaluating additional characteristics of the policy alternatives. Comparing legal practitioners and liberalizing UPL for legal aid and pro bono services. Due to its potential to reach a larger segment of the population than legal aid and pro bono services, licensing legal practitioners is the top-ranked option in terms of direct public impact. The widespread consensus is that monopolies are detrimental to competition and economic growth. A concentration of market power among attorneys creates high prices for consumers. Furthermore, less innovation, quality declines, and price increases routinely result from this form of monopoly in the market. Licensing legal practitioners would give the public access to a new legal service provider that would charge less than an attorney. Liberalizing UPL statutes for legal aid and pro bono would also do well in terms of economic efficiency because it would give those providers greater autonomy in offering services to the public without violating UPL statutes. For example, a paralegal or other support staff working for legal aid or volunteering in pro bono services could offer limited legal advice without direct oversight by a lawyer. Since there is only one legal aid attorney for every 8,000 North Carolinians eligible for legal services, this could result in more efficient representation since lawyers in those organizations do not have the bandwidth to address every legal question or need personally. Legal Regulatory Sandbox A legal regulatory sandbox is promising due to its ability to facilitate one to many innovations that could result in the scalability of legal services delivery. For example, Utah's Legal Regulatory Sandbox was approved in August 2020. 30 new companies existed in Utah's Legal Regulatory Sandbox as of September 2021. Data from the report indicates that these innovative providers are meeting a spectrum of needs, including end-of-life planning, 19.6%, business-related matters such as intellectual property, contracts and warranties, and entity incorporation, 22.3%, and marriage and family, 15%. Other types of legal services currently available via the sandbox include education, real estate, domestic violence, and immigration. There have been over 3,000 requests for legal assistance from over 2,500 unique individuals. Over 550 legal services are now provided entirely by software, illustrating the importance of technological advancements. However, the sandbox ranked below licensing legal practitioners and liberalizing North Carolina General Statute Section 84 for legal aid and pro bono workers. This is primarily because it is less certain what innovations might result from a legal regulatory sandbox that could directly benefit those in the access to justice gap. Additional considerations when ranking the regulatory sandbox include the cost, access to technology issues addressed above, and the need for many with legal problems to have broader scale representation. Court Navigator Program The Court Navigator Program, based on the program in New York, scores high in political feasibility and legitimacy because the concept is likely to be well supported as it can be staffed with volunteers, and the judiciary is likely to favor it. Additionally, it is unlikely to see significant resistance since it does not create competition for lawyers. However, services are limited to providing legal information and documents inside the court building, and volunteers are prohibited from providing legal advice. For the public, the help of a court navigator would be beneficial but more limited than that of a legal practitioner or those who may be offering services under a more liberalized regulatory structure. Political Feasibility Analysis Many factors influence whether stakeholders would be amenable to the four policy alternatives described above. No study can clearly determine if the diverse stakeholders involved will be amenable to reform, particularly since each of them will be affected differently and may have distinct or even opposing views on the best way to address the access to justice crisis. Stakeholders may include the public, government agencies, partner agencies, lawyers and judges, paralegals, educators, social workers, evaluators, technical specialists, and many others. Each stakeholder may evaluate these policy alternatives using different standards and criteria that reflect their positions, interests, and assumptions. 
While we have completed an extensive internal analysis of the various stakeholders in North Carolina, below we briefly address the known and likely positions of major stakeholders, public officials, subject matter experts, and community partners. We have solicited information, example, statistical data, and potential social, educational, and cultural perspectives from public officials, subject matter experts, and community partners in developing this report. Many of these stakeholders have provided a letter addressed to the North Carolina General Assembly substantiating the findings in our report. As detailed in the numerous letters attached to the appendices, many individuals and policy and research institutions have a vested interest in assisting the various civil justice systems across the United States in achieving outcomes that are fair and accessible to all. While they may have no official standing concerning policy decisions in North Carolina, they speak for groups disadvantaged by their socioeconomic status, their position as a minority in society, or the interests of legal professionals and paraprofessionals. These are commonalities that affect all states, and North Carolina is not unique in terms of the issues we have asked them to address. Additionally, many of these individuals and organizations administer resources related to regulatory reform. As subject matter experts with extensive programmatic knowledge and formal and informal connections to different stakeholder groups, they are remarkable in their ability to assist in understanding and developing regulatory reform initiatives. These stakeholders can also aid in understanding the potential economic impacts of the policy alternatives being considered and the legal landscape around the potential policy alternatives. Judicial officials. Moreover, we anticipate some support from judges with experience managing self-represented, pro-SE, dockets. Self-represented litigants who have poorly drafted documents or who misunderstand court orders may find themselves at a disadvantage. Judges have empathy for self-represented litigants but are hesitant to deviate from standard court processes to avoid giving the impression that they favor self-represented litigants over parties represented by lawyers. Therefore, judges may be amenable to regulatory reform that assists self-represented litigants and makes their work less cumbersome. Private practice lawyers. We anticipate that many attorneys will oppose any regulatory reform that they feel will increase competition in the legal industry. Of the policy alternatives addressed above, the Court Navigator program will likely draw the least concern from the attorney population because this policy alternative does not necessarily require a statutory change to North Carolina General Statute Section 84 or to relax UPL prohibitions. Despite the reservations of the attorney population, however, the vast majority of community groups and members of the general public are likely to regard these policy solutions favorably because they will increase access to legal services. Legal aid and pro bono providers. Further, based on activities in other states, such as California, we expect that some interest groups that provide legal aid through nonprofits may oppose regulatory reform that they fear may result in competition for funding from state legislatures. Due to past budget cuts and limited funding, there may be a concern that legal aid providers will be viewed as requiring even less funding if another, less expensive category of legal service provider becomes available through one of these policy alternatives. The legal aid community is most likely to view court navigators and the liberalization of UPL for their workers as the more favorable policies of the proposed policy alternatives. Summary of alternatives, recommendations, and rationale. As discussed above, initiatives adopted in other states include 1. Licensing legal practitioners, reducing fees for services. 2. Liberalizing North Carolina General Statute Section 84, unauthorized practice of law, for legal aid and pro bono services. 3. Creating a legal regulatory sandbox. And 4. Establishing a court navigator program. Each of these innovations may require changes to North Carolina General Statute Section 84, unauthorized practice of law, to relax the monopoly on legal services. None of these four alternatives to the current policy will solve the access to justice crisis alone. Therefore, to do the greatest good, we recommend concurrently exploring two policy alternatives. One, liberalizing North Carolina General Statute Section 84, unauthorized practice of law, for legal aid and pro bono support personnel not acting for financial or personal gain, and two, licensing legal practitioners. Implementing both options concurrently would have the most significant positive impact on the access to justice gap. Recommendation number one, liberalizing North Carolina General Statute Section 84, unauthorized practice of law, for legal aid and pro bono services. Legal aid and pro bono service providers would be granted waivers from the unauthorized practice of law statutes. These waivers would allow support personnel to provide limited legal services on specific civil legal issues to clients who qualify. The waivers will be granted only to those who complete the required training in ethics and the substantive area in which the legal aid or pro bono services are offered. Legal aid and pro bono providers would provide all necessary supervision and oversight. Liberalizing North Carolina General Statute Section 84, unauthorized practice of law for legal aid and pro bono services would benefit more of those who already qualify for legal aid and pro bono. Services under the strict income cap guidelines, particularly since legal aid presently lacks the resources to assist everyone who qualifies for services. Support personnel could supplement existing attorney staff and pro bono attorney efforts in several areas of law, including domestic violence, housing, consumer protection, government benefits, health care, and more. Recommendation number two, license legal practitioners, reducing fees for services. 
Licensing legal practitioners would make legal services more affordable to those who can neither qualify for legal aid or pro bono services nor afford an attorney. Licensing legal practitioners would also provide the following added benefits. Improved outcomes for legal matters where food, clothing, shelter, and family stability are impacted to help preserve the family structure, positively impact the economy, and provide social stability. Advocacy and moral support during a legal crisis where people fear the court system and may not engage otherwise. Assistance for those who lack or struggle with technology, completing court forms, and understanding state and local rules. Assistance for clients with physical disabilities and other special needs who might have difficulty accessing the court system. Moreover, legal practitioners could help reduce the strain on the court system by reducing dismissals and do-overs caused by insufficient legal filings and delays and continuances due to people who do not understand state and local procedures or processes. Court staff and judges frequently have to make tough judgments about how much they can do to aid parties without attorneys. This would improve judicial economy. When considering the impact of legal practitioners on the access to justice gap, whether the impact is medium or high depends on whether they are permitted to represent clients at hearings. The impact would be higher if the scope of practice included representing clients at certain hearings. This would require education and training in witness examination, trial advocacy, and other sections of North Carolina General Statute Section 8C1. The impact would be lower if representing clients in court were prohibited. The General Assembly might also consider a multi-tiered system where some legal service providers are limited to completing legal documents. In contrast, as Arizona has done, other legal service providers would be permitted to represent clients in court depending on their education and training. Note that the scope of representation varies among the existing limited licensing programs in other states, with Arizona leading the way in these tiered innovations. A case study, Lessons Learned from the Medical Profession. If regulatory reform of the legal profession seems like a Herculean task, consider the history of nurse practitioners. During the 1950s and 1960s, when medical specialization was at its peak, there was an extreme scarcity of family physicians in the United States. As in the legal field, rural communities were impacted most by this development. Physicians who had previously opted not to subspecialize began collaborating with registered nurses with clinical expertise to better fulfill the unique health care requirements of children and their families. Over time, there was an agreement among nursing leaders across the nation that nurses were experienced and informed about the health care requirements of children and families. This resulted in a concurrent increase in their functions and responsibilities. In 1965, one of these pioneers, Loretta Ford, collaborated with a physician, Henry Silverman, to establish the first training program for nurse practitioners. The University of Colorado's curriculum emphasized family health, disease prevention, and health promotion. Not surprisingly, the initial implementation of the nurse practitioner, NP, program was met with opposition. Ford, Silver, and their students encountered resistance from nurses and doctors who feared that the designation nurse practitioner was deceptive and would be misunderstood by the public and the medical community. Professionals in the healthcare industry were concerned that NPs lacked the qualifications to give medical treatments that physicians typically administer without supervision. Throughout the 1970s and 1980s, nurse practitioners worked to legitimize their profession. The absence of a licensing procedure and training and advancements in healthcare placed pressure on nurse practitioners to demonstrate their skills and overall contribution to healthcare. During this time, nurse practitioners documented patient satisfaction and developed criteria and standards of practice. Using evidence-based studies, they also monitored the increase in the availability of primary care to people across the nation. As time passed, nurse practitioners became a more essential and valuable component of healthcare, and they began to seek economic and professional recognition. More than 11 nurse practitioner organizations were founded in the United States between 1973 and 1985. Through these organizations, nurse practitioners earned credentials and complied with federal regulations and reimbursement policies by taking certification exams. The creation of the Council of Primary Care Nurse Practitioners by the American Nurses Association in 1974 helped strengthen the nurse practitioner's role. In 1979, there were roughly 15,000 nurse practitioners in the United States. The National Council of State Boards of Nursing had also established registered nurse certification as the prerequisite for obtaining an advanced degree in nursing. In 1985, only six years later, the American Academy of Nurse Practitioners was founded. Although the scope of practice for nurse practitioners varies by state, as of October 2022, 27 states and 2 U.S. territories had a full scope of practice. 13 states and 2 U.S. territories had a reduced scope of practice, and 11 states had a restricted scope of practice. As of May 2021, there were more than 234,690 nurse practitioners in the United States. While the push for recognition of the nurse practitioner profession was hard fought, today, it is easy to see the benefit of nurse practitioners. An individual can see a less expensive nurse practitioner for many medical needs, such as family health, gerontology, pediatric health, and acute care. An individual can see a medical doctor or specialist if the issue is beyond a nurse practitioner's scope. Access to alternative service providers allows specialization, but it also gives the public varying options, some of which are more financially viable. However, the healthcare field has not stopped there. 
A wide range of medical and mental health providers can aid the sick and support mental health. In the mental health sector, there are psychologists and psychiatrists, but there are also psychoanalysts, psychiatric nurses, psychotherapists, counselors, therapists, and social workers. While in the legal profession, 9 in 10 legal providers are lawyers, in the medical field, 8 in 10 medical providers are not licensed doctors, i.e., nurse practitioners, physician assistants, phlebotomists. Further, the stratification, or spectrum, of the medical profession extends across varying levels of education and experience, as seen in Figure 7 below. Figure 7's healthcare workers' career paths along the educational spectrum. In contrast, in legal services, there are only two clear career paths related to substantive law, and only one can offer legal services directly to the public. This system is inefficient and not cost-effective. To quote Camille Still, President and CEO of Lawyers Mutual Consulting and Services, where are all the other resources that our citizens need to deal with problems that impact their lives in no less devastating ways than sickness? Where can they turn? As one last point, the medical and legal fields have many similarities, but also some differences. The medical field as a whole is not necessarily a good example of frugality and low costs. This is primarily due to factors that drive up outlays. For example, there are a variety of usage and billing requirements from numerous payers that necessitate a substantial administrative workforce for billing and reimbursement. As another example, the medical technology and pharmaceutical industries all seek to profit from medical care, and often all at the same time, for an individual procedure, driving up costs, however. It is generally accepted that obtaining medical treatment from a nurse practitioner is less costly than receiving the same care from a physician. Legal practitioners could do for the legal profession what nurse practitioners have done for over 50 years in the medical industry. Additional recommendation for legislative study and pilot program. We realize licensing legal practitioners is a radical departure from the current policy. It might be politically challenging to implement, given the potential opposition expected from the attorney population, since some have already indicated they view this type of regulatory reform as an attack on their profession. Therefore, we are including two more recommendations. We recommend that the North Carolina General Assembly conduct a legislative study to verify the feasibility of the suggested policy alternatives. Representatives of the North Carolina Justice for All Project would welcome the opportunity to participate in this process. Additionally, experimentation and proof of concept are crucial to innovation. Many argue that no innovation exists without them. Therefore, if the state legislature were inclined to license legal practitioners, we recommend a pilot program to collect data and periodically evaluate outcomes. Many states with newly established legal practitioner programs are collecting data as they go along. These states have accepted that making an idea or concept into reality has thousands of variables that cannot always be figured out by discussing it around a table. Experimenting with a pilot program would allow the collection of meaningful data early in the process when it is still possible to make incremental improvements to the program without incurring high costs. As shown in Figure 8 below, the earlier state leaders begin to experiment and collect information, the faster the uncertainty is reduced. Doing nothing is a considerably more significant threat to North Carolinians than experimenting with safeguards in place to determine how we can improve the civil justice system. Figure 8 Discussing and Planning versus Experimenting and Executing Note Graphs created by JFAP and inspired by the Service Innovation Handbook by Lucy Kimball Conclusion Through this writing and pursuant to North Carolina Constitution Article 1, Section 12, the members of the North Carolina Justice for All Project have brought the above grievances to the General Assembly for redress. Because each policy alternative has the potential to narrow the access to justice gap for different segments of the population, ideally. All four policy options analyzed above would be implemented to fully capitalize on the opportunities for resolving the access to justice crisis. The crisis of access to justice is acute and persistent, requiring treatment as though it were an uncontained wildfire needing every available resource. North Carolinians need the support of private lawyers, paralegals, pro bono lawyers, legal aid providers, legal practitioners, court navigators, sandboxes, legal support centers. Alternative dispute resolution programs, scalable technological innovations, streamlined local rules, and standardized, easy-to-understand forms. However, state leaders must begin somewhere, and of the four policy alternatives presented, one, licensing legal practitioners, reducing fees for services, and two, liberalizing North Carolina General Statute Section 84, unauthorized practice of law, for legal aid and pro bono services are potentially the most pragmatic and least expensive options. It is our ethical and moral duty to seek justice and defend the oppressed. The first Chief Justice of the United States, John Jay, once said, Justice is indiscriminately due to all, without regard to numbers, wealth, or rank. Access to justice is a question of democracy, fundamental human rights, and economic efficiency. We have viable options to address the access to justice crisis. The greatest barrier is addressing an entrenched bureaucracy that is reluctant to re-examine whether what has always been done presently makes sense for the people. Regulatory reform would support social and environmental welfare while increasing market openness. A pilot program for both policy alternatives that includes mechanisms for public input and transparency would help increase the legitimacy, public trust, fairness, equality, efficiency, and effectiveness of our legal market and civil justice system.
We trust you will agree that making legal representation more accessible to North Carolinians is good for our communities and the administration of justice as a whole. For questions or comments concerning this report, please contact the author, Alicia Mitchell Mercer, Alicia at lexpmc.com. For general questions, please contact advocacy at ncjfap.org. Our website is www.ncjfap.org.